We now enter the territory of endocrinology, which is also a bugaboo. You had Porter. Porter's very good. He's taught me a couple things on stuff. So you already have a good background since you had Porter on endocrinology. So I will expand upon what he has and reemphasize some things that he taught you and put it more into a clinical aspect. Okay, when we think about endocrinology, let's not put that up there, you'll be staring at it, not listening. We have a very confusing nomenclature. If I have Hashimoto's thyroiditis with destruction of my thyroid gland, what do we call that? Primary hypothyroidism. So that's the gland that actually makes the hormone screwed up. That's primary. Well, what if I had hypopituitarism and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and I had hypothyroidism? What would that be called? Secondary hypothyroidism because I don't have the TSH to stimulate my gland to that. What if I had hypothalamic disease, sarcoidosis, destroying thyroid-releasing hormone? What would that be? Yeah, Sherry, very good. Now, we used two terms the other day, like hyperparathyroidism, okay? So if you had an adenoma on your parathyroid gland making parathormone and producing hypercalcemia, what would that be? Primary hyperparathyroidism. But if we had a, uh, for whatever reason, hypocalcemia, vitamin D deficiency or whatever, and it, and it asked the parathyroid to kind of increase that calcium level and, uh, and it underwent hyperplasia, what would we call that? secondary hyperparathyroidism. And what if, after a long period of time, that parathyroid lives and making it, making it, making it, making it, making it, and some dude wants to become a dictator now, and then all of a sudden you end up getting hypercalcemia, okay, then that's called tertiary hyperparathyroidism. And you don't have to worry about that because that's rare. But you want to get familiar with the term primary, secondary, and tertiary. I think the best way of remembering that is uh, the thyroid hormone. They seem to have no, no problem with dealing with it. Okay, the other thing you want to remember is, um, in terms of, of, uh, of processes and endocrine pathology, we have some situations where there's overactivity of the gland, and we have some uh, situations where there's underactivity of the gland. And so we have these different tests that we do, which confound medical students. We have stimulation tests. And what would we use a stimulation test for? If we have an underactive gland, we would probably do a stimulation test to see if we can get it to go get going again. If we have an overactive gland, we'd want to do some kind of suppression test to see if we can suppress it. Now, most of the time, the things that cause overactivity, we can't suppress them. There are two notable exceptions, however, to that where we can. And both deal with tumors in the pituitary gland, which are very common. One is a prolactinoma, can be suppressed. It can, it, can be, it, can, it can prevent the tumor from making prolactin. And, of course, you already know what it is that suppresses it because it's the treatment for a prolactinoma, and that's bromocryptine. Now, that doesn't mean anything to me that you know that. What is bromocryptine? It's a dopamine analog. So in other words, normally the reason why women are, don't have galacteria right now is they have dopamine inhibiting prolactin. Okay, so this should be no galacteria. Okay, so it's an inhibitory substance. In fact, you even use bromocryptine in treating Parkinson's disease because it is a dopamine analog, and that's, of course, what's missing in Parkinson's disease. Okay, so pro prolactinoma is a, as an example and pituitary Cushing's. That's a benign tumor in the pituitary gland making too much ACTH. You can suppress it with a high dose of dexamethasone. Those are the only two exceptions for a tumor that's over, making too much stuff, being able to suppress it. There's no way that you could suppress a, a parathyroid adenoma from making parathyroid hormone. There's no way that you can prevent an adrenal adenoma making cortisol from making cortisol. There's no way that you can prevent an adrenal tumor in glomerulosa from synthesizing aldosterone by trying to suppress it. It'd just say, boom, to you. Okay, it's just going to say, you know, you can't do dork to me. I am autonomous. Okay, so that's, that's the concept, stimulation tests. So let me give you an example. Let's see how you do on this thing. The patient has hypocortisolism. Okay, let's do an ACTH stimulation test. All right, and so we do hang up an IV drip and we put in some uh, ACTH. 
And um, we led a trip in there for a couple of days, and we're collecting uh, uh, urine for 17 hydroxy corticoids. That's the that's the metabolic end product of cortisol. And nothing happens. Okay, we just never increase it. So what was the hypocortisolism due to? Addison's disease. The gland was destroyed. So you can stimulate it with ACTH until to Timbuktu, and it's not going to make anything. But let's say after two or three days, all of a sudden we started seeing an increase in 17 hydroxycorticoids. So now before you tell me, what's the cause of the hypocortisolism? Hypopituitarism. In other words, it was atrophic because it wasn't being stimulated by ACTH. But, but when you gave it ACTH, over a period of time, it was able to regain its function again. And so you were able to distinguish by that simple test what the cause of hypocortisolism. Of course, there's even a simpler test. That's ACTH. You know, if you have Addison's causing hypocortisolism, what would ACTH be? High. And if it was hypopituitarism causing hypocortisolism, what would ACTH be? Low. So, I mean, really, it's not all that bad. Okay, you've got lots of other tests to do to prove it. But they like you to see if you understand concepts. And so they ask these things. So let's deal with uh, hypopituitarism first and tell you the most common cause in adults. And that's right up here. That is a pituitary adenoma. It's been lifted out of the cell of tursa. Look how big that's. They can sell it Who can tell me what bone it is? That's your anatomy question. Senoid. Just remember the surgery. Transsenoidal surgery. That must mean that that's where the cell of is. Okay, you can see that it's expanded and there's the tumor. They're usually non-functioning and it just basically over time um, destroy all the normal pituitary as it grows and you end up with hypopituitarism. That's the most common cause in adults. Now let's say you have a pregnant woman. She uh, has a bruptial placenta, goes in a hypovolemic shock, but you get her out of it. She's doing fine. She's feeding her baby at home on the breast. Suddenly, breast milk stops. What's she have? She has postpartum necrosis. Big deal. What does that mean? That means she's infarcted her pituitary. Take a look down here. That's coagulation necrosis there, guys. And this is just a little bit of residual pituitary. Now, some of you are thinking, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Isn't that counter to what you said about the brain? Did you say that that's called liquefactive necrosis in the brain? I did. But this is the pituitary. Okay? Pituitary is not the brain. Okay, and so when you infarct it, it undergoes coagulation necrosis, not liquefactive, because it isn't brain. Okay, and so you can obviously see. So in other words, the mechanism is ischemic necrosis, coagulation necrosis, and she has postpartum necrosis. You want to know why? If you're pregnant right now, your pituitary gland is two times the normal size right now. Okay? That's, that means it's really kind of a little uncomfortable in there in that cell of that's because of all the prolactin that's being synthesized. So how come a woman that's pregnant doesn't have galacteria? Because the estrogens and progesterone inhibit it from being released. So the moment you give birth, okay, then that, that, that uh, inhib inhibitory effect is released, then you start having galacteria and you're expressing milk. Understand? Okay. That's the second most common cause of hypopit in an adult is she has postpartum necrosis. Most common non-functioning pituitary adenoma. Child, craniopharyngioma. Craniopharyngioma uh, is of Rathke's pouch origin. Okay, Rathke's pouch is, uh, is, the, uh, the, uh, is part of the embryological development of the pituitary gland. And little pieces of it remain. It can become neoplastically transformed in what is, what is called a craniopharyngioma. It's not a malignant tumor, it's a benign tumor, but it's in a bad place. Now this one is most commonly supracellar. What's supra mean? Above what? Cella. And what it does is it goes down and, and eventually uh, destroys the pituitary. But it likes to go forward and it bumps into something right in front of it. It's called the optic chiasm. And what kind of visual defect you're going to have by, by temporal hemianopsia. In fact, they almost all had visual field defects with a cranial pharyngioma. So if they talk about a kid who has headaches and has a visual field defect, or they actually do a schematic that shows the visual field defect, and they ask you what's causing this, then the answer is cranial pharyngioma, tumor of Rathke's pouch origin. 
Okay? Now, when you have a tumor that's, uh, that's expanding in the cella turcica, the different releasing factors uh, uh, or hormones decrease uh, at, at, in a certain succession. The very first thing that usually gets destroyed are the gonadotropin. That's FSH and LH. So if I was a woman, what would happen to me? I'd have amenorrhea. And of course, it'd be secondary amenorrhea. Okay? What if I was a man? What's the analogous condition that men have that's analogous to amenorrhea in you guys? Impotence. Impotence is to a male as amenorrhea is to a female. Don't forget that. Impotence is to a male as amenorrhea is to a female. What is impotence? Impotence is failure to sustain an erection during attempted intercourse. That's the definition of impotence. So a male will become impotent. The next thing that goes is growth hormone. And we know that growth hormone really only has two functions. We know it increases amino acid uptake and it's involved in gluconeogenesis. So who's the one that produces the, the, uh, the bone growth and the soft tissue growth? Well, that's in sunlight growth factor one, okay, which is present in the liver, IGF-1, which Porter taught you. Another name for that is somatomedins, same thing, okay? So in other words, growth hormone, when it's released, has to stimulate the liver to release insulin-like growth factor one, to cause the growth of bones, linear in this way, and soft tissue. So that's that's job, okay? Now, of course, a, an adult with a loss of growth hormone is not going to get smaller, okay? But they'll have the effects of the lack of growth hormone, and that is they are going to start losing some muscle mass, and they're going to have fasting hypoglycemia because growth hormone normally was gluconeogenic. And so if it's not there, then it's not contributing its function to enhancing gluconeogenesis, you're going to have hypoglycemia. So that's only what you'd only see in an adult. But what would you see in a child? Oh, it would be a pituitary dwarfism. And you know that's an example of hypoplasia? Hypoplasia is an incomplete development of something. Well, basically, a pituitary dwarf is an incomplete, deli, uh, de incompletely developed child. Now, the child looks totally normal. Totally. Everything looks normal except everything's smaller. So it's a, it's a, it fits the definition of hypoplasia. And that's because they lack growth hormone. Okay, so what would be the stimulation, the best stimulation test to see if your growth hormone or insulin growth factor deficient? Sleep. Sleep. You grow when you sleep. In fact, you grow at exactly 5 a.m. because that's when growth hormone comes out. That's the best stimulation test if you suspect a growth hormone deficiency, you collect blood at 5 a.m. in the morning to see if growth hormone, actually a better test, insulin growth factor 1, that's a better test to see if it's increased. If it isn't, you're deficient. Now, why is it that arginine and histidine are essential amino acids? And you probably, Well, you don't know that yet. Well, maybe you do. That's more biochemistry, what you're getting next week. I really strongly suggest that you all attend those lectures. That is one of the areas that most students are absolutely weakest on is biochemistry. Most people did not very good get a good biochemistry background in their schools. I didn't. I mean, I didn't know when I took my boards, I didn't know a single thing I saw on the boards. It was structures and all that crap during my boards. I don't have that on yours now. I had no idea what they were talking about. And somehow I passed it. I have no idea how. I just I must have been a good guesser. I had a horrible biochemistry course. I don't know anything. Now, I know... A hundred thousand times more now, uh, biochemistry. In fact, I teach my medical students for the board review uh, at my school and, uh, you know, for this test, okay? I don't have a problem except the DNA. No dork about DNA. But all the other stuff, no problem. But it took me years to do it, okay? So it's, it's, it's poorly taught. And so you don't have a really good grasp on it. And the boards knows that. And they really get into it. They really get it. Your high yields will be very useful because it will give you some hint about how they really get into it and a lot of answers to those things. Listen to Hanson, though, because she knows what's on the test. And she's an excellent teacher, better than anyone I've ever heard. And I've heard them all, Harvey, Champ, you name them. I've heard them all. She's better than all of them. Do not miss those lectures. I heard that you have a tendency of sometimes not attending lectures. Don't miss these don't miss these lectures. 
or you will be severely compromised on your ability to do well on biochemistry on this exam. Don't miss those lectures. She's good, and she's interesting, too, and she can do clinical applications, too. In fact, I thought the best notes in the whole uh, Kaplan series were hers. Okay, they were excellent. They were excellent notes. So don't miss those. If I were you, you'd be good. That would be really stupid to miss those, sit out on those lectures. So I can study it on my own. Nope, nope. She's going to do a better job of uh, teaching you biochemistry than you studying it on your own. Better. Do you understand? I'm just suggesting that to you, not demanding it, because I ain't going to be here. I'm going to be, I'm going to be with my own little dudes teaching them hematology next week, okay? Okay, so you can do what you want, but I'm telling you, if I were you, I'd listen to what I say. You don't want to miss those lectures. Okay, well, arginine and histidine are absolutely essential for normal growth of a child. Why? Remember, those are basic amino acids. Answer, they stimulate growth hormone. That's why weightlifters go to the store and get arginine supplements. They even know it, okay, because it stimulates growth hormone. Okay, these little iron heads go there, and they even know that arginine and histamine and ornithine and all those things stimulate it, and that's so they get supplements to deal with it, okay, and uh, try to build up their muscles, okay? So sleep is the best, and an arginine stimulation test is the second best. All right. The third thing that goes is TSH, so that's, so that's an obvious one. They're going to have hypothyroidism, okay, so that low TSH, low T4, no problem on that. And you all know the signs and symptoms, you know, cold intolerance, delayed reflexes, fatigue, brittle hair, the whole bull, the bull diggies. Okay. The next thing that goes is ACTH, so that means you're going to have hypocortisolism. And again, that's kind of like growth hormone. You're not going to have, you're going to basically be fatigued with a low cortisol level. And cortisol is also gluconeogenic. You're going to have fasting hypoglycemia. That's about it. So ACTH would be low, cortisol would be low. The last thing is prolactin, of course, in a non-pregnant person, you'll never know you have that. So those are the order of succession, which you don't need to know the order of succession, but you do need to know if they were absent, what would happen. Let's talk about uh, diabetes insipidus and how you distinguish it. The central versus nephrogenic. Central means you're lacking ADH. One of the more common causes of that is a car accident where you whack your head and your, and your brain goes <coughs> and your stalk is staying still and you sever your stalk. Okay? And one of the first things that's going to go, actually, is the ADH, because you recall that antidiuretic hormone is made in the supraoptic and paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. And in that same nerve that it's made in, it goes down this big old axon through the stalk and eventually is stored in the posterior pituitary. Same, same, same big nerve. So if you sever the stalk, you sever that connection, you're ADH deficient, and immediately... Well, you're not, not only ADH deficient, you're also deficient in all the releasing factors that are made in a hypothalamus that stimulate the pituitary. So you'll be hypopit eventually too. But initially, you'll have the signs and symptoms of diabetes insipidus, which is polyuria and, uh, and, uh, and thirst, tremendous thirst, and you're just peeing all the time. Okay, That's central. Nephrogenic means you have ADH. But you, it doesn't work on the collecting tubule to make, it re, uh, to make it permeable to free water. That's called nephrogenic. It's extremely easy in differentiating these two things. There's lots of other polyurias, guys. Don't forget diabetes mellitus, mechanism osmotic diuresis. Okay? Polydipsia, you just drink too much water. That's usually a psychological problem. Hypercalcemia produces polyuria, okay? So don't forget that there's other things in the differential. But for part one, they think that any second-year medical student should know how to differentiate central from nephrogenic. So let's do it. It's very simple. Remember, if uh, using our little formula we taught you, CM sodium equals TBNA over TB water, if you're missing ADH or it doesn't work, you're losing water. Not salt, pure water, okay? That means what you're doing is you're constantly diluting and you're never going to be able to concentrate urine. The exact opposite of inappropriate ADH, where ADH is always there, and you're constantly concentrating, and you're never going to dilute. 
In diabetes in serpent is you're, you're constantly diluting your urine, losing free water, okay? And you're never going to be able to uh, concentrate your urine. Just the opposite. So you're losing all this water. Of course, serum sodium is going to, up, going to go up, and that equates with an increase in plasma osmolality, because recall, most of the plasma osmolality is sodium. Okay. The way you do this test, guys, is you restrict water. Okay, so let's do that. Here's a normal person that you restrict water on. And what you're seeing is the plasma osmolality goes up to 292. That's right at the upper limit of normal for the osmolality. And look at this, a 750 urine osmolality. Now, what does that mean? They're concentrating. You deprive them of water. And so if that's true, then you should be concentrating your urine. In other words, getting water out of it to add back to your ECF and bring that, bring that serum sodium into the normal range. Huh? And this dude did it, okay? All right. Now, let's look at this patient over here, these two patients. We restricted water on them. They had a 319 and a 312 osmolality of plasma. That's elevated. So, in other words, they have hypernatremia when you restrict it. Well, let's look at their urine osmol. Look at that. 110 and 98. Whoa. First is the normal. So, you know, they both have diabetes and sympathies. It can't be anything else. Okay. You know that. So how are you going to know which one's which? You give them ADH, another name for its vasopressin. So you give it to them and see what happens to the urine osmolality. If it increases greater than 50% from the baseline, then it's central. If it's less than 50%, then it's nephrogenic. So here we go. We look at this dude. Okay, you give him ADH, he went to 550. Is that greater than 50%? Yeah, so central diabetes and sympathies. End of discussion. This guy went from a rip roaring 98 to a rip roaring 120. Is that, is that a good response? So what does that patient have? Nephrogenic. End of discussion. Very, very simple. The students go crazy on this. Oh, it's a graph. It's a graph. I'm like you. You see a graph and stuff like that, I go crazy. I don't understand graphs. I'm dysgraphia. I have some kind of problem with this. I don't know what, what lobe there's a defect, but I sure do have it. And also arithmetic. So I have dysarithmetic here. Really, I do. Okay. Diagnosis, please. This is a, a picture 10 years ago of her driver's license. This is her now. Same person. She's got acromegaly. Great board question. What's the cheapest way of screening for acromegaly? Say, do you have an old picture of yourself? Okay? And you get that picture, and then you look at that person now. And, and that is one of the best tests. That's cheap, isn't it? Just looking at a picture. <laughs> okay? Think cheap, remember. You see it in all the textbooks. They always, say, always look at an old picture. You know, people don't know they're changing that much. And even the people they're living with, they just kind of just used to it. But someone maybe that's been away for 10 years and comes in there and say, uh, where's Joan? I am Joan. You don't look like Joan. You're lying. You're an imposter. Is that much of a change. Okay, now you know, you know that we call it a gigantism if it's a kid whose epithesis have infused. And so when you get an excess of growth hormone and insulin growth factor, you're going to have an increase in linear growth. So they get to be giants. Many basketball players are classic acromegaly. There's a guy from Croatia right now. What is he, 7'6", something like that. He was in a movie with uh, Billy Crystal. If you look at his face, he has clear-cut acromegalic features, and he's seven six. I forget the guy's name, but he's got acromegaly. There is no doubt about it. Jaws and James Bond. Uh, he's dead. He's dead. He's uh, he's dead since died. He he had uh, acromegaly. He's dead now. Uh, Andre the Giant, the big wrestler. He's dead. So in other words, it's a bad disease. Very bad disease. He died cardiomyopathy. So they have excess growth hormone, and they have excess insulin-like growth factor. So what about if you're an adult and you get an excess of this? Then you get acromegaly. You're not going to get taller because your epiphyses are fused, but the bones can go wider. And one of the bones in your head that does that is the frontal bones. And so they stick out. So you get this kind of this uh, uh, almost gorilla-like increase in the, in the frontal lobes. So your hat size increases because they increase in the frontal sinuses. Your hands get bigger. This is a normal hand here. This is a person with acromegaly. Your feet get bigger. Every organ in your body is bigger than it should be, including your heart. And that produces a cardiomyopathy, and that's how you die. That's how you die. Okay? 
That's all I have to really say about that. Most of you would know how to recognize this. And I have another picture to show you when we're done, uh, when we go through the slides pictures. Galacteria is always a common question asked on exams. Men don't get galacteria, guys. Uh, men don't get it because we don't have enough uh, terminal lobules to make it. So don't expect if a man had a prolactinoma that he's going to have galacteria. So I just want to just tell you that right now. Galacteria is a very interesting problem in women. And there's many, many causes, guys. And you better make sure that you get every drug that they're on, over the counter, under the counter, obliquely to the counter, and whatever to the counter, what angle to the counter, on the floor, whatever. All of them. Because there are many, many drugs that can stimulate prolactin synthesis and release. Try birth control pills. They can do it. Okay. Hydralazine, calcium channel blockers, um, and different kinds of psychotropic drugs can all stimulate um, prolactin synthesis. And then the big one is the primary hypothyroidism. You always have to get a TSH. Why? Because if you have Hashimoto's, not only is TSH increased, but also the releasing hormones increase, TRH. And TRH is actually used as a stimulation test for prolactin. So, God Almighty, you have to rule out hypothyroidism in a, in a poor woman with galactorio. Can you imagine, you know, doing a neurosurgery on a woman that has galactorio due to hypothyroidism, only to find out there's nothing there in the pituitary? Not very cool. All right, so we've got to root out all of that stuff. When all of it's negative, okay, and you have a high prolactin, then the diagnosis is a prolactinoma. Okay? In fact, any prolactin level over 200 is always a prolactinoma. I mean, that's, there's, no, there's no drug that can do that, increase it. I'll tell you a common one that oftentimes women get worked up and everything's normal, but they still have galactoria. I can tell you what the cause is if you're interested. It's the bra rubbing on the nipple. See, tactile stimulation of the nipple will cause breast milk. When they talk about a wet nurse, okay, for feeding a baby, I hope you don't think it's someone that is already feeding a baby by breastfeeding and you just use the other breast for your baby. You can have an older woman and you can put a baby on her breast and over a period of time, the suckling reflex will occur and she will end up uh, producing breast milk and she can feed that baby for you. It's tactile stimulation. Some women are super sensitive to, uh, to stimulation of the nipple, and that will cause galactoria. That's, the, that's very common. The lactic levels will be normal. No drugs are causing it. You rule it all out, and you go crazy. Okay. You want to cure that thing, just, just get a, a bigger, a bigger uh, bra and put some kind of cup underneath there where there's no stimulation of your nipple with anything. It'll go away. Just thought you'd like to know that. It's a pearl. Now, why... Our, our patients uh, that have a prolactinoma, why do they develop secondary amenorrhea? Simple. Because prolactin inhibits gonadotropin-releasing hormone. See, that's why that's a cheap birth control pill for at least three months after you've delivered a baby. Because if you're breastfeeding, your prolactin levels are high. It's inhibiting your GnRH. And so you're kind of protected, at least for a couple months. But eventually it'll break through. So it inhibits gonadotropin-releasing hormone. And that's all I really have to say about prolactinomas. Always ask guys, must know stuff. Now your bugaboo, thyroid studies. I'm going to tell you what you don't have to know. You don't have to know resin T3 uptake to diagnose these diseases, okay? And you don't need to know free T4 indexes. There's only three things you need to know. T4, TSH, and I-131 uptake. And most of the time, you don't even need I-131 uptake. That's all you need. In fact, if you only add one thing, TSH. If TSH is normal, guess what? Your thyroid is normal. Okay, it's just that simple. If TSH is decreased, okay, then that means you could have hyperthyroidism or hypopituitarism. TSH is increased, then they have high primary hypothyroidism. TSH is what most endocrinologists only get. They get the super sensitive TSH. If it's normal, forget it. They don't have an underactive, overactive gland. Their thyroid is normal. That's the cheapest test okay, to do. That's your best screen. Not T4, worthless. Let me tell you why. You'll see. Now, you have these diagrams. Let's go through it. 
you know that thyroid binding globulin, binding globulin is the binding protein for thyroid hormone. What's the binding protein for cortisol, please? Transcortin. Okay, what's the binding protein for calcium, please? Albumin. All right. What's the binding protein for iron? Transferrin. What's the binding protein for copper? Ceruloplasmin. And what percentage of the binding sites are occupied by whatever it is? Uh, roughly 30%. Good. Okay. I'm, this is all a schematic, guys. The numbers are, are not accurate. The concept is. I'm saying that this is normal right here. We have two thyroid binding globulins here. Okay? And I'm showing these black dots representing thyroid hormone. There are nine binding sites, and I'm showing three of the nine occupied. One third. And similarly here, and this is the free T4 level right down there. When we measure a total T4, guys, it's, it's T4 bound and free. Okay? And so we have three, six, and six is 12. So the total T4 in this schematic is 12. But what's the free hormone level, the part that's metabolically active when it gets converted into T3? Six. So this is the part that's, that's actually doing all the work. The part that's bound does not. The total T4 in this, in this schematic is 12. The free T4 is 6. And if that's the case, then the TSA should be normal. Agreed? Agreed? Okay. What happens if you're on a birth control pill or you have some kind of increase in estrogen? Thyroid binding globulin, so does transcortin, increases. All right? So we have a situation like this. So right now, women... You're on a birth control pill. This is what's happening to you. Right now, women, if you're pregnant, this is what's happening to you. Okay? You're going to get increased synthesis of thyroid binding globulin. So I'm showing that increase there. Are you with me? Well, immediately, that's going to be one-third occupied. Now, where does that come from initially? It's going to come from your free hormone loss. So I'm showing these three going over there. But because everything's in equilibrium... In a millisecond, the thyroid gland senses that the, it's gone down a little bit and it replaces those three immediately. That's the key. So has the free T4 level altered at all? No, it's still normal. So what should the TSH be? Totally normal. But what's the T4 going to be? Let's count. Three, six, nine, plus six is 15. You have an increase in T4. But has the free hormone level altered? No. Has the TSH been altered? No. So what does an increase in T4 with a normal TSH mean, please? You're on estrogen. It's just that simple. You're on estrogen. And that's true of any pregnant woman, any, 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 any woman on estrogen. So the total T4 is elevated not because you've increased the free hormone level, but because you increased thyroid binding globulin, and it, and it automatically is, uh, is occupied by one-third of its binding sites by thyroid hormone. The same thing is true for cortisol. If you're pregnant or you're on a birth control pill, your cortisol level is elevated. And you don't have signs of Cushing's. Why? It's elevated because transportin is increased because of the estrogen increasing synthesis of it. And so there'll be more cortisol bound to it, but your free cortisol levels are still normal. Both questions were asked on boards. Now, Remember what I said, if you're a weightlifter or a professional football player, what are you on? Anabolics. <laughs> okay. What does it do? The opposite. How do you think anabolics work? Anabolics break down proteins that you normally would use for making other things to build up to put into your muscle. And the proteins it likes to go after are binding proteins. And so when you're on anabolics, Thyroid binding globulin is decreased because the amino acids that you would use would have used to make it are used to go into your muscle to make your levator palpebrae stronger because you're not you're not being able to contract enough. You got to get that equal size and strength on both sides. Or maybe the muscles in your fingers are not exactly the same, so that when you when you flex, the muscle isn't that good there. You want amino acids to go into it. So obviously, they wouldn't work if you didn't take amino acid supplements, would it? <laughs> no. It's also a false way of getting muscles. Okay. Did you know that Arnold Schwarzenegger did both? He took growth hormone and anabolics. And if you want to see acromegaly, just take a look at Arnold. <laughs> Holy smoke. He is such a classic acromegalic, it's unbelievable. He's even got gaps in his teeth because the jaw grows, okay, and the teeth get gaps in it. That's why he has gaps in his teeth. It's got the classic lantern jaw. I mean, you can almost use it in, in architectural design for a square. 
<laughs> and he admitted to it. You know, he admitted to being on growth hormone extracts and also anabolics. Stupid. Stupid. So, we're showing here a person that's on anabolics. And we're showing one less thyroid binding globulin because it isn't being synthesized because the amino acids were used for something else. Comprende? The same number of sites are occupied, the same number, the 3T4 is still the same, it's just that you're missing thyroid binding globulin. So let's count. 3 plus 6 is 9. The total's decreased. But is the free hormone level normal? Yes? What's the TSH? Normal. So if a person has a low T4 with a normal TSH, what are they on? Anabolic steroids. If a woman has a high T4 and a normal TSH, what is she on? Estrogen. If a person has a high T4 and a low TSH, what do they have? Hyperthyroidism. If a patient has a low T4 and an increased TH, what do they have? Primary hypothyroidism. Did we need resin T3 uptake to make this diagnosis? No. It's a worthless. You don't think endocrinologists actually look at those, do you? All they look at is the TSH. Now, what's the I-131 uptake? That's a radioactive test. Remember, what is thyroid hormone? Tyrosine with iodine on it. That's a board question, by the way. All the different things that you can do with tyrosine. Melanin. Tyrosine, tyrosinase. Dopamine. Goes into the Golgi apparatus, becomes melanin. Keep on going with tyrosine, phenylalanine, tyrosine, dopamine, dopa, norepinephrine, epinephrine. Catecholamines eventually come from it. Put some iodides in tyrosine, thyroid hormone. Pretty important, pretty important amino acid. Okay. Now, what was I going to with this? Oh, the I-131 uptake. So does it make sense then that if we had hyperthyroidism because our gland was overactive, Graves' disease. That would be making more thyroid hormone. Agreed? Would we need more iodide to do that? Of course. So if I gave a person radioactive iodine, would there be an increased uptake of that radioactive iodine in that overactive gland? Yes or no? So I'll have, what would I have? Increased I-131 uptake. Agreed? But what if I was taking excess thyroid hormone to lose weight. What would I do to my TSH level? Suppress it. And if I gave at that person, I could actually have signs of hyperthyroidism, but, but now it's because they're taking too much hormone. What do you think their gland's doing when, they, when they're taking that excess hormone? It's atrophied. So if you gave an I-131, radioactive I-131, would there be an increased uptake in their thyroid gland? No, it's atrophied. So is that the main way that you can distinguish if a person has true evidence of hyperthyroidism on whether it's because their gland is making too much hormone, Graves' disease, versus someone that is surreptitiously, purposely, or does it unknowingly, taking too much thyroid hormone and producing hyperthyroidism? What would be the best test of distinguishing? I-131 uptake. There's an increase, your gland's making it, you've got Graves. If it's, if it's decreased, you're taking it. You just, you just confront them. So you're taking thyroid hormone. No, no, I went to this weight loss clinic, and I promise you I'm not taking it. The weight loss clinic. Anytime you see in a weight loss clinic, guaranteed 30 pounds, 30 days, or money back. Well, I can tell you right now, there's going to be a pile of pills given to them, and a lot of them are going to be cow thyroid gland, which is going to purposely make them hyperthyroid, and then they're going to, get, keep, then they're going to keep their promise. So you're going to lose weight, okay, but at what expense? Hyperthyroidism. Big time. Okay? Good. Midline cyst. Midline cyst right there. Diagnosis. Thyroglossal cyst. Okay, remember the thyroid gland originally was at the base of your tongue and then migrated down the midline to its current location. Uh, cyst in the anal lateral portion of your neck. Diagnosis. Branchial cleft cyst. So midline, thyroglossal, anterolateral neck, branchial cleft. Better know all the branchial cleft derivatives. <clears throat> Every one of them. They like the ones around and up in the head area, especially. 
Okay, thyroiditis, that's inflammation of the thyroid. Really the only important one, very honestly, is Hashimoto's. I don't think I've ever heard them ask a question about the subacute, in other words, d I've never heard them ask that. So the only thyroiditis I would know is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Okay? Diagnosis, just, just scan it around. What has she got? You said grains. How do you know it isn't... Um, She's taking too much thyroid hormone. Ah, she's got exophthalmic. In other words, you're telling me that's unique to Graves' disease. That's correct. The reason for that is, is the excess glycosaminoglycan is being deposited in the orbital fat. And it's pushing her eye out. That's absolutely pathognomonic of Graves' disease. Now, this poor sucker over here has got malignant exophthalmic, and he's going to lose both eyes. Okay. All right. Now, you don't believe that person has Graves' disease, do you? Yeah. All people, when they get Graves, have what is called apathetic Graves. Classic example is George Bush Sr. His wife, any idiot, knows that she has Graves. Her eyes have popped out of her head. Even the dog had Graves' disease. <laughs> but George Sr., George Sr., had Graves' disease. I thought he was, I thought he was a cretin. Initially, when his arguments, you know, when he was trying to get this reelected, I said, come on, get with it, George. Get with it. What's the matter with you? He was apathetic because he had Graves' disease. Here's a fact you want to remember always. All people with Graves' disease have heart problems with atrial fibrillation. That's what you want to remember. They get heart manifestations more than anything else. In fact, is a pearl. Any patient with atrial fibrillation, you absolutely must get a TSH to rule out Graves' disease, whether they look like they have it or not, and then you're going to diagnose lots of Graves. If you're just thinking that, oh, I can tell they look jittery and all that, then you're going to, you're going to miss 8 million cases of Graves. Any patient with atrial fib, you've got to get a TSH. And that's what they did. He had problems with atrial fibrillation. I remember they said he has an arrhythmia they were talking about. And finally somebody there figured out, maybe we ought to get a TSH on George. And they did, and it was suppressed. There's no way. You look at that woman and say, she's hypothyroid. <laughs> but she had atrial arrhythmias and heart problems. She had grades. Her TSH was totally suppressed. T4 up. Okay, now you all know the signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism, right? They have heat intolerance. They have sinus tachycardia, sometimes atrial fib. They have brisk reflexes, they have diarrhea, they have systolic hypertension, right? They potentially could have hypercalcemia, that was asked on boards, they wanted to know the mechanism, increased bone turnover. Basically what it is, guys, it's adrenergic. All the symptoms of hyperthyroidism are catecholamine things. Do you know why? Do you know why? I already told you why. I went from phenylalanine to tyrosine to dopamine to dopa to norepinephrine and epinephrine. T4 increases the synthesis of beta receptors. Guys, catecholamines are the cousin of thyroid hormone. They work together. Okay. All of them are. All of the symptoms are adrenergic. I'll rest my case with this. What's the treatment, the initial treatment of Graves' disease? Beta blocker. Why do they think they're doing that? They're blocking the adrenergic response, and it goes away totally. Then what you do is you give them propyl thiuracil to stop big land from making it. But you can stop all the symptoms except, one, sweating, with, that's a board question, a beta blocker. I'll rest my case. Okay, that's that. So what's the thyroid studies on this patient? What's the T4? High. TSH? Low. I want 31 uptake. High. Okay, good. This patient is, uh, these patients have hypothyroidism. This one a little bit more advanced than this one. One of the key areas you want to look on the face in hypothyroidism is the periorbital area. There's always puffiness there. Little puffiness. You can see it over here. Now that's admittedly a very, very... Uh, Lots of people look puffy. Why is it puffy? Glycosaminoglycans. Glycosaminoglycans. 
I was having such fun I could hardly hear this thing. Okay, so we'll we'll break and we'll come back to this. Mm-hmm.